Okay, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone. It seems that Jill is having trouble signing in. So on behalf of Jill and Anna, I will be opening this fifth session of our monthly Tech Talk. In this installment of the Tech Talk, we will be diving in into isolation technology and environments. Audio and um, the visual is clear to everyone. It's not a to me as seems that way. So welcome for this fifth um, Tech Talk session. Today's um, speaker will be Jeremy Adonayu. Um, Jeremy is part of the Global Platform Board of Directors. He is a Director of Engineering at Qualcomm. He's currently the Chair of the Test Platforms and Test Attack Working Attack Experts Working Group. He is also responsible for SOC security architecture and has previously worked on development of software focused on secure platforms and NFC. So if there is any expert that can really dive into isolation technologies, it will be Jeremy. Without further ado, Jeremy, please take over the presentation. Oh. I will hope that the technology is working nicely and that you can see the front panel. Uh, this talk is an introduction to a much more detailed work item that we have started recently in the TS Platforms Working Group, which will provide a much more thorough overview. I have about 40 minutes remaining. That's a very short time to cover uh, what is a huge topic. Uh, I won't, I will skip over the introduction to myself, although it will remain in the slides for those who download you. I will say that I have a tendency to be unable to uh, avoid putting small geeky references into my uh, slide decks. You'll have to excuse that. Uh, I know we're not at Black Hat, but it sometimes makes these things more fun. Jeremy, um, we can only see um, your speaker view. So we're showing three slides, uh, sorry, two slides. Oh, okay. So you've got the wrong slide. Let me see if I can change the share. Well, the, the, yeah, the view is oh, on okay. speaker view, so. That should be that one then. There we is go. That, okay, we that's worry right. about who I am. That's not Perfect. very important. Uh, I've been introduced. Oops, now I have to work out how to get. Okay, so I'm going to use the term workload here uh, to describe something like a computation that needs to be performed in some sort of isolation of other workloads. Um, in an automotive use case, we could talk about a workload as perhaps an instance of, a, of an ECU uh, control unit, or perhaps it could be telematics as a whole function, or perhaps it could be some kind of uh, other machine learning type workload. The important part is that we want some sort of isolation. Um, there are two types of isolation that we can think about. Uh, temporal isolation, which is sometimes in the safety world called temporal freedom from interference, um, which guarantees that a workload receives some expected share of resources over time, that it actually has the opportunity to run, that it has the opportunity to access the resources that it needs. That is not a major topic in this presentation. The main topic is spatial isolation or the safety people sometimes call it spatial freedom from interference. The basic idea that we want to ensure that the resources that we allocate to a workload are inaccessible to other workloads. Um, I'm going to make an assumption when I go through this slide deck, which is that people can read more quickly than I can speak. So you will see more material that I don't fully cover on the slides. Um, <clears throat> a critical thing to say is that the TE in particular, Global Platforms TE, has traditionally focused on spatial isolation. And often many TEs did not give much consideration to temporal FFI, although as many of us are now in industries and uh, verticals where this is more important, there are solutions. Um, but here I'm mostly talking about spatial isolation. So we shall start with the simplest case, um, isolation by processor boundary. So in this case, each workload has a processor. It has its own private memory. It has its own peripherals. Uh, it might talk to other processors through some sort of shared bus. Uh, but essentially, 
you have each process, uh, each workload completely isolated on a separate computer. This is the traditional ECU model used in automotive. Uh, it's often also used in, for example, industrial control. Because each workload is in its own processor, the processor can be made sufficiently powerful to run the workload. It can have enough memory. And generally, everything is optimal except cost. I should also say that the one part here where isolation may be a problem is that separate uh, shared connection. Because although we have a bus, you might want to ensure that the messages that go over that bus are authenticated and that they, are, that they have their integrity protected. That has often been a weakness of this type of system. Uh, you might also need to make sure that there is sufficient bandwidth on that bus to support all of your safety use cases. And generally, securing these kinds of system where you are isolating by processor boundaries becomes difficult if you have a multi-vendor environment. So what could we do? Uh, what options do we have? So I guess we could follow the, gen the history of general purpose computing here. And I'm first going to talk about isolation by process boundary. This is the type of isolation that you are likely to see on something like a Linux or a Windows system. Essentially, you have a kernel which is running in some sort of privileged mode. And it is providing the temporal and spatial isolation between a set of processes. Each process has a view of resources on the system, and it can make system calls to manage those peripherals, to manage its own memory needs, or to communicate with other processes. And we put the workloads inside these processes. So now we have three workloads here, as shown, running on one processor. Uh, the CPU um, <clears throat> provides hardware, usually something like a, a memory management unit or an IO memory management unit that we will talk about later, that enforces that spatial separation. It's a piece of hardware that helps us with the spatial separation. It's not the only one, but it's probably the most important. Um, as I mentioned, this is kind of following the history of general purpose computing, and it originally solved the question how do we get better utilization of our expensive computer? And to some extent, this type of, this type of uh, aggregation of workloads into processes is the first stage of how do we make things cheaper and more flexible? Um, <clears throat> so the kernel scheduling policy provides the temporal isolation. The kernel mechanisms like syscalls and device drivers, the memory management provide the spatial isolation. So suppose we want to do more. Suppose we want um, to go a little bit further and provide yet more levels of isolation. We could imagine isolating by virtual machine, <clears throat> uh, virtualization as it's often called. And in this case, we add now a new privilege level. So previously we had the kernel and the processes. We add now one for a hypervisor. And what the hypervisor does is it provides the illusion of several instances of the hard machine hardware, but actually running on only one machine. The difference from a kernel and a, a traditional execution environment of that type is that the hypervisor generally presents much more hardware-like abstractions to each of its virtual machines because it is presenting effectively virtual hardware. And that abstraction means that lower level of abstraction means that a hypervisor is usually smaller and simpler than an operating system kernel. Uh, hypervisors, interestingly, were first developed for the mainframe world again in the 1960s, and everybody forgot about them until the 2000s when people realized that you could consolidate workloads into uh, servers as servers were becoming sufficiently powerful. So what if we need to go further still? Um, we've already added levels of privilege to add isolation. And so you might want to know, well, 
is there any security problem you can't solve with just one more privilege level? And broadly, the answer seems to be no. Uh, I do want to mention a few things, though, about hypervisors before I move on. Uh, the first is that on the left-hand diagram, you will see the an example of the uh, hypervisor construction I used in the last slide. This is what we call a type one hypervisor. The hypervisor runs directly on the processor hardware. There is another option. Uh, if you have uh, a laptop and you use uh, something like VMware or VirtualBox to run, for example, Linux on your Windows laptop, you are using a hypervisor that is hosted by an OS. We sometimes call this a type two hypervisor. And in this case, the hypervisor is something like a device driver or a module uh, in Linux. This would be something like KVM. And the hypervisor device driver provides the view needed by the virtual machines. But in addition, the main operating system is running. This has an advantage in terms of user experience. The regular operating systems kernel can ensure that workloads running in its own process, which are often UI intensive, uh, get enough performance to have a, an attractive UI. But it has the disadvantage that the trusted computing base, if you like, the, the total code in the trusted kernel plus the hypervisor is a lot larger than a hypervisor on its own. So you lose some security properties in return for gaining some properties of flexibility and interactive use. And now we come to yet another level of privilege. This is getting closer to state of the art. Um, I call it isolation by world. Um, Arm would call it CCA probably. Um, but essentially, the idea is that we now want to partition our systems still further into environments that probably have different security properties. Um, it is sometimes used to provide and support new properties on legacy architectures. So, for example, um, ARM has relatively recently introduced CCA, which allows them to provide uh, support for confidential compute, which we'll get to later, uh, without having to put that into Trust Zone, which has quite a large legacy of existing software and would be problematic. Um, <clears throat> ARM, Intel, RISC-V, and AMD all have uh, solutions of this type. The thing I call a world visor is essentially providing a further abstracted view of the machine to each of the hypervisors. Uh, <clears throat> and I would say that there's quite a lot of architectural difference here. What I show here is broadly at a high level view, more like ARM and RISC-V and perhaps slightly less like Intel or AMD, but functionally they achieve the same thing and the security properties are essentially the same. So um, let's summarize what we have so far as abstractions that we can use for isolation. We have the world. Sorry, we start with the process. Process has a nice standardized, fairly straightforward, abstract programming environment. Those who are programmers would probably recognize it as basically the environment provided by the C standard library plus Linux syscalls, for example. Uh, the process is the smallest common unit of system construction in these types of system. Uh, kernel has to be trusted and it manages and shares resources. Usually the kernel has drivers in it, um, although there are micro kernel based systems that do something else and move the drivers into user modes. We have virtual machines where we are emulating some sort of actual machine to make it appear that one piece of hardware is several. Simplifies porting, simplifies aggregation and hypervisors uh, because they are often simpler than general purpose OSs, typically can have slightly stronger security guarantees. Um, as an indication of what I mean by the trusted computing base, as of 2020, Linux was just under 28 million lines of code for the kernel. 
and about 70,000 commits a year. Uh, most of that is device drivers, but Linux by any standards is a very, very large project. Uh, the Zen hypervisor, as a contrast, is a little under 50,000 lines of code. So 50,000 lines versus 27, 28 million. Um, it suggests, it gives you an indication of the difference in the trusted computing base that we're talking about. And then worlds, as we mentioned, typically are providing an even smaller trusted computing base and to separate for different types of security property. So now let's think about the some of the hardware mechanisms that we can use to help us with isolation. And I will say from the start, because I know there are some very expert people who are on this uh, on this call, that I am missing many, many things. I am talking about some of the main mechanisms, but we can get into interrupt controllers, we can get into all sorts of other areas. I'm going to start with the memory management unit, though. And it's closely related cousin, the IOMMU, or if you're from the ARM world, the SMMU, uh, which does much the same thing as the memory management units, but it does it for peripherals. And it usually shares pages. So a memory management unit essentially provides isolation mechanisms by, config, by having trusted entities configure tables in memory. Um, the system that I am showing is a type one hypervisor with three stages uh, in the MMU. That's about the most you're going to see normally. Uh, the first stage uh, is pretty much always present. Uh, the second and third stages are optional and you have them if you need them. Uh, I should say that again, this is roughly how ARM and RISC-V fit do things. Um, AMD and Intel have a slightly different approach to managing the same role that stage three checker performs. Uh, but again, the goal achieved is very similar. So let us suppose I have a process in the virtual machine uh, and eventually I want to access a piece of physical memory. How do I do that? Well, the first thing I do is that the process only sees things called virtual addresses. So the process starts a read of its virtual address and assuming that that, that particular uh, data is not in any of the caches and there are many, the first thing we have to do is to walk through the stage one page table uh, until we find the right stage one page. So the, the page table may have multiple levels, but effectively we are iterating until we find the right page in stage one. And that will tell us what ARM calls an intermediate physical address. Um, again, others probably have different terminology, but essentially this means the view of the physical system that is presented um, by the hypervisor to the virtual machine. It isn't a real physical address. We probably need to go to the next stage, uh, which means that we now look up the IPA in our stage two table, which is another walk through some data structures in memory, uh, and we will get a physical address. If we are using one of these world-based schemes, we will then need some mechanism to check whether the physical address we have is actually available to and granted for use to the particular world that we are in. So we may walk through another table and eventually we have a physical address. We put it out to the bus uh, and we can therefore, uh, sorry, and by the way, the bottom line should not say hypervisor, it should say bus. Uh, so that's a correction I'll do before we send out the slides. Um, and then we get we fetch or, or, or write to physical memory. It should be pretty obvious that this walk through potentially multiple stages of page table could be quite expensive. It could take a lot of uh, reads until we find the actual data that we want. And so there are two things we can do to make that better. Uh, the first is that most CPUs allow you to define different sizes of pages. If you make the pages fairly large, and typically that would be maybe a megabyte or so, then the page tables are smaller and iterating through them takes less time. Uh, 
On the other hand, if you need fine grained access, you can also have small pages of about 4K, for example, on an ARM processor. And now you may have to have multiple levels in each of your stages of page table. In other words, there is a trade-off between the granularity of your page size and how long you're prepared to take looking it up. On top of that, we have a thing called, or thing that ARM calls a TLB, a translation look-ahead buffer. And that is an associative cache of recently looked up page table entries. If the page that you want to look up is already in the TLB, then you can avoid all of this lookup. So a few things that are important in terms of isolation here. The first is to look at who owns and configures each of these stages of page table. Generally, in a system of this type, the kernel of each virtual machine will configure and manage the stage one page table, and there will be a separate stage one page table for each virtual machine. What that means is that the kernel for the virtual machine is responsible for the spatial isolation of resources on the bus between its processes. It is trusted to do that. The stage two page table is normally then managed by the hypervisor because the hypervisor is responsible for providing the isolation between virtual machines. I didn't draw here uh, an entity, but if you have a stage three world style checker, you're going to need another trusted entity, which is responsible for configuring that checking table, uh, what ARM uh, would call the granule protection table. And that is usually an even more trusted firmware entity. It would probably be machine mode in a RISC-V system or EL3 in an ARM system. In other words, the most privileged part of the, the processor. So we, we have obtained isolation, but we've obtained it at a cost. And the cost is that when you consider that your CPU's probably got two or three levels of cache, we have these complex page table walks. We have TLBs, which could be of different sizes for different CPUs. It actually becomes quite hard to reason about your memory lookup performance and one important thing that this means is that very often the worst cases can be very bad indeed, even if they don't happen very often. And that can be an issue when we start talking about temporal isolation, where you need often guarantees about availability. It also means that when you change any of these tables, you're probably going to have to perform cache management operations to flush relevant parts of the cache, and that's going to slow you up for a while until the cache has become repopulated. So we've talked about application class processors so far. What about microcontrollers? If we look at the traditional view of an RTOS, everything runs in a single privilege level. You have the kernel, which provides abstractions like threads, um, probably some system memory pools, uh, some sort of library. And there's almost no hardware-based isolation. So if we put workloads into such a system, there is basically a model that says everything trusts everything else. Any workload can interfere with any other workload or the kernel. Why might we do this? Well, it's fast. Uh, you're going to get pretty optimal performance. And in particular, context switches between workloads will be fast and predictable. Uh, RTOS kernels are often somewhere between small and very small. And typically, it's it's not too difficult to verify that they behave as you would like them to. You can sometimes have language-based isolation. So if you come from the secure element world on a global platform secure element, um, which typically are running Java card as an OS for their workloads, the Java card verifier provides spatial non-interference guarantees, which are um, produced essentially at, at, at compile time when the uh, application is being uh, prepared for installation. You can also do similar things with safe Rust, although you kind of have to be good at type level programming. Uh, I should point out that if there are any um, traditional real programmers in the room and you hate abstractions, you can obviously replace the RTOS with 
bare metal assembler programming. The security model is still the same. There's no isolation. And we want to go further than that. And again, please forgive me because I am hugely oversimplifying a complex area here. But as we found with application processors, one more level of isolation comes to the rescue. And essentially, we provide a similar approach to isolation by process boundary with many of the advantages and disadvantages that we saw on larger operating systems like Linux. However, we probably don't want the cost, the complexity of some sort of memory management unit for this class of device. Um, it varies, but the page tables for uh, even a fairly simple architecture are rarely less than something like 64 to 128K of memory. And on a real Linux system, they're often a lot larger than that. And 64 to 128K of memory is often more memory than you want for your entire MCU. So MMUs are generally not appropriate. Instead, we have a thing called a memory protection unit or an MPU. And these generally have register programming interfaces that let you control and define a small number of regions. Uh, it's usually something like four to 32. MPUs, once they get much beyond that, tend to become quite large. Generally, you can program the start address of a region and its length. And this MPU will be programmed by the kernel in its privileged mode. In other words, when process one is being switched to, the kernel will ensure that only the resources process one is supposed to see are visible to it. And it will do that by using the MPU to isolate all of the others. When the context switches to process two, the kernel will reprogram the MPU to make access available to the resources of process two and so on. Um, as with um, Linux style operating systems, it is most common in this type of system to put drivers into the kernel. In fact, it's even more common than it is in larger systems because generally we only have a fairly small number of regions that we can use on an MCU. Um, and those drivers are commonly uh, an important attack vector because you control the kernel, you control the system. I should also say that this type of uh, memory protection unit can be used in conjunction with a, a, an MMU on a larger system. RISC-V does it, for example, with its PMP, but it can become quite hard to reason about the access control behavior and therefore the isolation it provides because the programming point of the MPU and of the MMU are usually not the same. So I'm going to move on to something brand new. Uh, as far as I know, you can't yet buy this. Uh, it's a system called Cherry Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions. Uh, it is particularly focused on MCUs, and it's um, the product of research uh, between multiple partners. The main ones are Cambridge University, ARM, Microsoft Research. But the research has been published in a pretty open way, and the um, sort of reference design is actually uh, based on an open source RISC-V. Um, I should say what a capability is. The formal definition is that it is a communicable, unforgeable token or authority. Uh, in other words, communicable, I can send it from one object to another, and unforgeable, there's no way to fake it. In practice, it is usually a reference to an object and a set of access rights. And then we have some hardware-based instructions that mean that capabilities can only be passed at the same or reduced permissions across boundaries between uh, compartments. A compartment is a container for untrusted code. It generally has a well-defined entry point or call gate. It has a defined set of memory regions it is allowed to use. Um, <clears throat> and Essentially, you can only enter and exit your containers, uh, you can only enter your containers at the defined entry points. The other thing I should, the, the two things I should say about Cherry, which are important for our purposes. Uh, first of all, there is a lot of formal design. There are really good theoretical foundations around Cherry that say it works quite well or should work quite well. And in particular, in the 
microcontroller space, you can support a much larger number of mutually distrusting workloads than you reasonably can with an MPU. And the people who have worked on this say that very roughly the extra cost of these additional instructions is about the same as a 16 region um, memory protection unit. So Cherry is something that if you're really pushing the boundaries, you can go and read the research. Um, it's, it's very good and interesting. I don't believe you can buy one today, but in a few years time, I think it is likely to be an important part of the isolation story in the MCU space. So let's sort of um, now look at some of the things that we might need to do from a systems perspective to provide that isolation and in particular, to provide a relying party with confidence that that isolation exists. Uh, so I have mentioned a few times trusted computing base. I'm not going to spend a long time on this uh, because I could easily do a 45 minute presentation about roots of trust. Um, I will say that we start our trusted computing base. It is all of the hardware, all of the firmware and all of the software that sits below some workload that I care about. And in some sense, it is a chain of trust. Starting from the root of trust, the bottom layer, we build up a chain of trust where uh, we can ensure that the security of each layer depends on what came before it. There is a great document from the Global Platform uh, Security Task Force, which is referenced here, I can also point you to excellent materials from the Trusted Computing Group and from NIST for that matter, which will tell you far more than I have time to do today about roots of trust. The only final thing I will say generally about the root of trust is it is immutable and small, and it has to be so. That is a necessary characteristic. So the next thing that we might need to start to tell a relying party, yes, you, you have a secure system, is attestation. Uh, this slide is based on uh, a structure and an architecture that's been defined by the IETF. Uh, there's a working group called RATS, um, Remote Attestation, and they have an architecture document, which you can read, uh, which talks about these uh, ter this terminology. If we look at the middle diagram, this is the basic structure of attestation. We have a target environment, which we would like to understand characteristics of. And so, and we have an attesting environment, which we trust to collect claims about that target environment. A claim here could be something like, um, a hash of a piece of firmware, it could be the debug state, it could be uh, the state of any fuses that have been blown to, for example, to put a skew on the device. And those claims are recorded by the attesting environment, which cryptographically protects them. Usually it signs them, might encrypt them. And it then sends them as evidence to a thing called a verifier. And the verifier will look at that evidence and basically say, yes, this is a secure device, or no, this is not a secure device, or possibly, I don't know. If we move to the middle diagram, this is a more realistic example of how attestation is used, although I'm simplifying still. We have a root of trust, which contains an attesting environment, and it runs from ROM. It is immutable. Uh, it first loads a bootloader, and the bootloader it then collects it then collects claims about that bootloader before it starts the bootloader executing. It signs those claims, and that provides evidence for the bootloader. The bootloader then starts, and it's used to load a kernel. The bootloader itself contains an attesting environment, and that attesting environment can collect claims about the kernel, C. So we now have two pieces of evidence. We have the evidence for B, which was collected first by the root of trust, and the evidence for C, the kernel, which was collected by the bootloader. And we send those to the verifier. Now, I'm now going to mention two other parts of the system. 
a reference value provider. The reference value provider basically has some known good values for the evidence for B and for C. And also endorsements, for example, uh, if the device that is generating all of these uh, attestations is a Qualcomm device, an endorsement might be a Qualcomm public key which you can use to verify the, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the signature over the uh, attested evidence. So endorsements are the things that help us to understand who is vouching for the claims made by the attesting environment. Uh, and then we have composite attestation on the right. This is a device which contains or, uh, perhaps multiple pieces of silicon. Think of a mobile phone with an EUICC. The EUICC can generate its own attestation. The SOC can generate its own attestation. And a leader tester then combines those attestations, sends them to a, to a verifier. And of course, now we need to have a larger number of reference values that come from a larger number of organizations and a larger number of endorsements. So in the real world, these things start to become quite complex and we may well need public key infrastructure and other things to make them practically usable. The other thing I will mention on the layered attestation just briefly is that we have, and you will hear about schemes like DICE and TPM and Mars, which are trusted computing group technologies, which very often operate in this layered manner that you effectively generate a key based on the evidence from one layer that you use to sign the next layer up of evidence. Why is attestation important to isolation? Well, some threats. Is my workload running in a cloned device or on an emulator? Or has the trusted computing base been tampered with so that I can no longer trust that the whole thing is going to behave as I expect? Attestation is an approach that allows us to have confidence because each of the layers, and on the right-hand side, we have a more realistic attestation chain. Uh, at each point, the layer below has verified a layer. And if all of the layers have good values, we can be pretty confident about our target environment, at least at boot time. Um, the biggest problem is managing this large set of trustworthy golden measurements because they will change with every firmware update. And so if you are, say, a car vendor or a phone vendor and you have millions of devices out there, that's an awful lot of possible golden values you might need. Um, Global Platform, of course, has standardized the trusted execution environment. Again, that is a 45 minute talk on its own. I don't want to therefore say too much. You can see the TE system architecture, uh, which, which was the source of the diagram on the right. But TEs generally are de designed to, pro to provide a reasonable level of protection to valuable assets on the system. A TE might be a completely external device. It could be internal and using shared resources on the processor, something like ARM's trust zone would be a good example here. Or it might be a separate in-package security subsystem, which is broadly how Intel's uh, TDX operates. Normally, TEs provide only a limited set of service, basically cryptographic operations, trusted storage, those types of fairly simple operation, uh, but sufficient to build quite trustworthy systems. I will specifically, though, point out to you, there are lots of ways to architect a TE. Um, and they may have different properties. For example, where you are sharing resources, you are going to have a different problem with temporal isolation than if you have a completely separate uh, in-package security subsystem which has its own schedule. Um, as far as the TE's own software architecture is concerned, this is a global platform TE, again, very quick introduction. Regular execution environment on the left has client applications. These communicate with associated trusted applications, which perform security services for the client application. 
Typically, these are things like key management. Um, so in mobile phones, it's often used for DRM, for example, for managing the keys for DRM. Uh, it might be used to hold an automotive key store, uh, a she, I believe they're called. It may be used for attestation of the re regular execution environment and possibly even attestation at runtime. So it may take a look at runtime to see whether code has been modified. From a security architecture point of view, you can't just take an existing application, throw it in a TE and say it's secure. You really do have to do some more work of separation. So I said that we would get to confidential compute and distrusting the hypervisor. So I think I'm gonna run over by a couple of minutes. I shall claim that uh, we started a few minutes late and I hope you'll be able to stick with me. <laughs> Let me paint a scenario, uh, So, or two scenarios. One is I own a company, I've driven 10 million kilometers collecting data to train an ADAS system. The training data is probably a large part of the total value of my company. And if I'm selling my product to an automotive OEM that also is perhaps trying to develop its own such system, they're a competitor, I might want to protect that training data. Or perhaps I'm an auto vendor, I'm using telematics I'm gathering lots of information about reliability, common failure points of my product range, behaviors of customers in my vehicle. I want to process them in the cloud, but that information could be hugely valuable to a competitor. And so I might not want to trust the hypervisor to provide the separation I'm looking for. And so the first part of confidential compute, it can be used alone, usually is not, is can we find a mechanism to distrust the hypervisor? And generally, what that means is having mechanisms whereby the hypervisor can donate resources to some other environment, but once it's donated them, it can't any longer see them. And whilst there are various ways to do this, one way to do this is to have the hypervisor in one world, as we discussed earlier, and my confidential environment in a different world. If you are using an ARM system, for example, the hypervisor most likely runs in non-secure EL2, and the confidential compute enclave management, which ARM calls the realm management, uh, the RMM, is running in realm EM2, EL2, a separate world. When memory is donated or lent from the hypervisor to the, conf the confidential world, the hypervisor no longer has access to it. So it manages, but cannot see. And that allows us to have a confidential environment that now depends on a smaller trusted computing base, probably some high privilege firmware and this enclave manager. And these are usually controlled by the silicon vendor. Uh, for those who don't want to trust their silicon vendor, uh, at least for the moment, I have mostly bad news for you. Um, but you can trust me. The second part of confidential compute is cryptographic isolation. In other words, as well as having my distrust of the hypervisor, perhaps I'm going to go further and encrypt all of the memory in my confidential enclave. And if I do that, lots of things happen. Um, the first one is that potentially I can control the key that I use to encrypt that workload. And that actually does provide me with a little bit of protection from the silicon vendor. You still kind of have to trust their key management, but it, it helps. Um, on top of that, if you use encryption in memory, a lot of the side channels that can be used to either uh, recover or modify data that is in one enclave from a distrusted, from, a, from an, uh, an attacking enclave, many of those techniques don't really work. Or if they do work, they work very badly. Uh, you can, for example, use authenticated encryption to provide integrity protection. So at this point, we have cryptographic as well as other hardware-based isolation. And at this point, this is a full-on confidential compute solution. Who controls the keys and the memory protection engine? Um, I've called it high-privilege firmware. 
that could be in a TEE, it could be in a root of trust, or it could be some combination of the two. So I've mentioned that this is a huge topic um, and I have barely skimmed the surface. I've gone rather quickly. Uh, I apologize if this has been too quick for everybody. Um, certainly we're lacking in detail. I didn't talk about containerization, which is another technique for providing partitions in a uh, within a more process-like environment. Docker would be one of the best known or um, things like jails, SE Linux also provide some additional guarantees. I didn't talk much about peripheral virtualization and isolation, uh, things like PCI TDIS. Um, and I didn't talk very much at all about the properties of different types of attestation scheme. There are many um, and how they can be used. These are all in scope for the work that we're doing. We will be producing a survey document, which I hope will be out towards the end of the year. I would be delighted to see anybody on this call uh, participate in that work and especially to provide contributions. I hope you found this talk reasonably interesting. I do apologize for going over by three or four minutes, um, but that's it. I'm done. Thank you all very much. There are a couple of questions, Jeremy. First from Frank. Okay. Where, yeah, are, sure. where are containers in these different concepts and what degree of separation do these provide? Uh, okay, so um, this is, let me see if I can go backwards. So a container essentially um, runs a something that looks like a virtual machine within a process. So you can imagine it as a workload that looks a lot like a virtual machine. And typically what they are doing is that they are providing a restricted and uh, mapped set of syscalls. So to a first approximation, a container is a special form of process. So I, I hope that sort of helps. Another... And in particular, that, that's why they're lighter weight than, for example, a VM. Uh, so world-based isolation versus separation kernel. Um, Thank you, Freedom. So with all of these things, um, it's a little bit, there, there's a lot of nuance. Um, <clears throat> so there are separation kernels. One of the best known is probably SEL4, um, which is a formally verified microkernel. And in that formally verified microkernel model, we have isolation by process boundary, but the level of isolation provided has been formally proven to exist. Uh, and then everything else than that very small kernel runs in user mode processes. So even things like memory management device drivers are normally moved to processes. That is what usually people mean by separation kernel. Whereas a, a world-based isolation typically involves a further uh, privilege level in the CPU. So in the world based, so uh, in the world based case, we are talking about something more like this. So from a hardware perspective, it is more complex. The downside usually of separation kernels and, and something like SEL4 is that you tend to have a lot of IPC uh, because everything is running in user mode. The separated workloads in user mode as, are made as small as possible. That makes them very well isolated, very secure, but it tends to mean that you spend a lot of time doing context switching and often also running into issues with cache. Um, but on the other hand, it can run on a conceptually simpler system. Um, so you, you can in principle run um, SEL4 uh, with two levels of privilege, although I think in practice most implementations use three. Certainly it uses three on um, risk five. Uh, any other questions before I go? I think that's probably all of them. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It was a very interesting topic. So 
Thank you so much for that. Let me yeah, introduce... thanks a lot, Jeremy. Very clear. Yes, yes, Jill. You may introduce the next tech talk to everyone. No, no, go, 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 go. I was just saying yeah. thanks to so, Jeremy, but please proceed. Yeah. Yeah, for to, for everyone to look forward to our sixth installment for this tech talk will be in June twenty one. It will be presented by Mike Onsworth from IETF. It will be another um uh, installment of the post quant PQC. This time we will be diving into post quantum hybrid PKI and its hierarchies. So that's one thing to look forward to on June twenty one. 2024. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this tech talk. Most especially, thank you, Jeremy. It's a very interesting topic. Jill, any final words? No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Look to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks all for participating. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Well done. Thank, thank you. you all. Very good.